Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Priyank Jaini. I'm a fourth year PhD student. And today I'm covering up for Pascal, who's attending a conference. And I'll be talking about normalizing flows. So these are a family of deep generative models. Uh, this is not in continuation of your last lecture, where Pascal was talking about ensemble methods, but uh, the lecture before that, where he talked about variational autoencoders, or VAEs, and generative adversarial networks in GANs. So these are a different family of uh, deep generative networks. So for uh, example, for studying uh, this, the, the section 20.10.7 is, is a, gives a brief introduction on, on normalizing flows or autoregressive methods. Uh, and if you want complementary reading, then for a beginner, the tutorial of normalizing flows is a, is a good resource. Otherwise, you can also refer to this uh, paper that came out this year, the first three sections, but it's not necessary. So uh, the problem that we are interested in solving is that of density estimation, and that forms a core problem in all of unsupervised learning. So the problem of density estimation is that you are given some data points, x1, x2, so on till xn, so some data set. So here I've denoted these data points like this. And we are interested to estimate the density from which these data points were generated from. So for example, uh, if let's say you have some data uh, that comes from a normal distribution with a certain mean and a variance, and you're interested, if you're just seeing those data points, you're interested in knowing what is the density from which this data, these, this data set was derived from. So what would be the mean and the variance of this normal distribution? And so this is what we are interested in doing uh, density estimation. It has a lot of applications in machine learning. For example, uh, I'll give certain examples here. Uh, one is important sampling. So here in important sampling, basically you want to learn this proposal distribution, which should be close to your original density function. And in some cases, if it's not too close, then the error that you suffer can in fact become infinite. And that's not what you want. And so you want a good estimation of this density. In Bayesian inference, so you have done Bayesian learning uh, uh, in earlier in your course and for mixture models, etc. So there, sometimes what happens is that when you're doing Bayesian learning, the posterior distribution, you cannot uh, evaluate exactly because it becomes intractable. And so you want certain approximations for Bayesian uh, in uh, posterior. And so this there, uh, we, you need this. Normalizing flows and in general density estimation methods have been used for audio and image synthesis and many other applications, for example, network routing and sleep stage classification using neurological data or activity recognition, all of these have been solved in, by using some sort of a density estimation method. So it's, it's, it's very important that you have some good estimation methods for densities. More recently, uh, you all must have heard of this face app where you would uh, input some face or some picture of a person, and the output is an old version of that, of that person. So here in the first image, I have some images of uh, tennis players that I took from the Wimbledon side, and there they have shown these older versions of, the, of these tennis players. And similarly for actors here that you take the images and they become a more old version. Uh, of course, this does not apply to Keanu Reeves, but uh, otherwise this is how you see these images look like. Right, and so this is also in fact, the model here is that of a conditional generative network. So how they do is that you have trained a model uh, which uh, is conditioned on the fact that uh, is on old people. And so you give an image and it gives out an image of an old person. So this kind of a generation is called conditional generative models. And in my last slide, I will discuss um, uh, a flow-based method or normalizing flow that can actually do this exactly. So, so these are all examples of where uh, density estimation or these generative models are used for, right? Okay, so earlier in the course, uh, you, uh, Pascal talked about GANs and VAEs. So the question then should be that how are normalizing flows, which are deep generative models, different from GANs and VAEs? So first I give, again, a recap of what a GAN is. So in a generative adversarial network or GAN, um, you take some input distribution, and uh, I call this the source distribution. So the random variable is z, and the density is pz here. And this I've basically denoted as noise. So you take some source distribution. Usually, it is a standard normal distribution. And you pass it through what is called the generator network, uh, which has parameters phi. 
So you're taking this network, uh, this distrib uh, storage distribution, passing it through this network, and you get a distribution that is Q hat of synth. So this is a distribution over the synthetic examples. And you have some images or some data points or some data set which come from Q real, which is what you want to approximate. And you then pass this Q hat synth and these data points to the discriminator, which discriminates whether the ge examples generated from this distribution look like real or fake. And so you train your network in this manner, and ultimately uh, the training is said to be successful when you have trained the generator in a manner that the examples that you generate from here can no longer be discriminated by the discriminator as fake. And that is when the GAN training is successful. In VAEs, it's a, 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 it, it is, that you have some images now uh, or some data points X, you feed it through an encoder onto a latent space Z, right? And you choose this latent space yourself to be some distribution. Again, it is used to be a Gaussian distribution. And then you pass it through a decoder to reconstruct the data uh, that you trained it on, right? So, so for example, data points from your uh, distribution here. And then once you have trained this thing, then you can use a decoder uh, to generate images. So you, you sample something from this distribution that you have chosen, you pass it through this decoder, and then it will generate images there. So here you train it by uh, what is called elbow or KL divergence plus a reconstruction loss. And this is through a zero sum game. Right, so here both of these are basically uh, for synthesizing examples, but there is uh, something very common here. And, and that is uh, that in, in both these methods, what you have is some source distribution. And here this source distribution is, let's say something simple. So Z is a random variable. And the source distribution is chosen to be a normal zero, a standard normal. So this is your source distribution. And you're learning a transformation. I, I'm going to denote it with D. Uh, that will transform onto some complicated distribution that you want to capture. Uh, onto a random variable x, which follows q. So here this transformation t uh, for, for GANs is this generator g of phi, right? Because you, you input some z, which is this normal distribution, and you pass it through this network, and it gives you this q hat synth, which is this target distribution that you want to estimate. In VAEs, that's the decoder, the g phi, right? You take in this source distribution, and you transform it here. And in fact, normalizing flows also have this same framework. So what is it that GANs and VAs do, uh, cannot do that we want normalizing flows for? Well, they implicitly represent the density function. So you do not have the exact form of the density. So what I mean here is um, when I say, let's say, for example, I have a random variable, uh, z, which is, let's say, normal of z given some mean mu and sigma square, then I know that my density of z, p of z, is basically uh, 1 over root under 2 pi. Right? So now if I give you a point, let's say, z1, then you can evaluate p of z1 because you have this formula, right? This is the exact density. But you cannot do that with GANs and VAEs because they do not give you this exact density. So they represent these density functions implicitly. So you can do that in practice using some sort of numerical estimation, et cetera, but you do not have the exact representation. And in cases where you need this exact representation, um, you, this is where normalizing flows will come into the place, that they give you an explicit representation. So the, this is what uh, ultimately the agenda becomes, that we want to learn a transformation T that would transform some source density, so something very simple like a Gaussian or anything. So that is up to you what you want to choose that distribution to be. And would, so you learn a transformation that would transform the simple distribution onto a more complicated target distribution. And so we, we need to learn these functions and so that we can get an explicit representation of density. So the advantage of normalizing flows over these previous uh, models that I talked about is that it gives you an explicit representation of these density functions. All right, 
So it, it works on the principle of conservation of probability mass. So how, how, so you see here, this is, this is a probability distribution and this is also a probability distribution and we know that they have to sum up to one. So there is some sort of conservation going on here. And so we'll derive the formula using this conservation of probability mass. So I'll give an example using a, a random variable. So let's see here, what I have is a random variable on the interval zero one. So this is an example that I've taken from this tutorial on normalizing flows. Uh, and so I have this random variable over the unit interval, and I apply the function t of z, which is 3z plus 1 on this random variable z. And therefore, because it's a uniform random variable, I'll still get a uniform random variable. So x will be also a uniform random variable. But now, here, the probability or density of this would be 1 over 3, because I've multiplied this by 3, because the area here has to be the same as the area of this rectangle. But I have increased the support here. So here it was on the interval 0, 1, but now this is on an interval 1 to 4. So the length of the interval is, is 3 times. But then the, the probability becomes 1 third of this. So this is, what, this is like moving any point here onto here, any point here onto here, and so on. So this is what a function is doing. And so how we derive this conservation is now let's say I have some, function, uh, some point z, and it gets transformed onto x, and then I have another point here, z plus dz, for example, and this is an infinitesimal uh, uh, z plus dz, and so you get x plus dx, and so because there is conservation, then pz dz has to be equal to qx dx. Uh, yeah, because this is qx and this is pz, right? And now if you do a little bit of linear algebra, you can get that qx is equal to pz, times the absolute value of dz by dx. So here I've put absolute value because you see here, even if I have a minus sign, so instead of 3z, if I have minus 3z, the resulting density will still be the same. It's just that the support will now be from 1 to minus uh, 2 instead of 1 to 4. Right? So it's just a matter of uh, increasing function or decreasing function, but nothing else changes. And so I've put an absolute sign there to, to take care of this. Right? And this is the conservation of probability mass. So I'll make this more precise, and there is a name for this. So uh, it, it, does anybody recognize this formula from your very elementary statistics course? So this is uh, what is called the change of variables formula. So change of variables is that you have a random variable x, and you apply a function on it. That function needs to have certain properties. But you apply a function on it, and you get a different random variable, let's say y then the change of variables formula gives you the density of y in terms of the function that you have applied on x and the density of x. So we'll see that in the next slide. So, so this is what I had shown earlier. So in the univariate case, how it works is that you have, let's say, uh, z is your source random variable, and the density is pz. And x is the target random variable with density qx. And you are applying a transformation t from z to x. So you're transforming the random variable z to x. And you want to find what is this density qx if I know t and pz. And this can be written as qx is equal to pz times the absolute value of the derivative of the function t with respect to z. And you take the inverse. And you see from here uh, how you get this is that x here would be t of z. And basically, I've taken the inverse of that. So basically, I've just inverted this and taken the negative. So this, I'm just giving a hand wavy explanation of what is happening there. So this is what the change of variables formula is in one dimension, right? Any questions still here? All right. So in multivariate case, the extension of this change of variables formula is that now you learn a function t from rd to rd. So now you have this random variable defined on a d-dimensional space, and x is on rd as well. You want to learn a function t from rd to rd. And so the the formula now becomes qx is still qx, but now it, this is a vector. pz is still pz, but now this becomes the determinant of the gradient of the function t times the inverse. So this is the formula here. Now I'll, I'll explain here what this, uh, this transformation really means because this is a little bit more involved here. Okay? But this is the formula. So what does this transformation t from rd to rd really means? So, Perfect. 
So let's say I have x that is in RD, so a random variable in RD, and uh, z, which is also a random variable in RD. So what this means is that x is a vector. So let me write it more explicitly as this. So I'm right, right now I'm putting it these vector signs, but in the slides I don't have that. So, but still, uh, so this x is basically x1, x2, so on till xt. And z is also z1, z2, so on till zt. And we are learning a function t from x to z. Oh, sorry, z to x. So here, because this is from a d-dimensional uh, vector to another d-dimension, this function t will also have uh, d components. So basically, this t is composed of univariate functions t1, t2, so on till td, where x1, so this x1, is basically t1 of the vector z, so which is the same as t1 of z1, z2, so on till zt. So or you can think of it as, let's say I write, for example, a function x1, which is of the form z1 plus 2z2 plus 3z3 square, and so something like this, some, some sort of function like this. Right? So this is a, this is a univariate uh, variable now. And this is the function I'm writing. And this is what I'm writing as t1 of z1, z2, so until zt. And similarly, x2 will, will be a function t2 of z, which will be t2 of this thing. And again, some function like this. And so on to xt is td of z, which is td of whatever I have here. Right. So now in that, so this is what this function looks like. When I say a function from RD to RD, so if I remove this z and x and instead write uh, RD and RD, it's basically this kind of a function. So it's a, uh, it's a multi-valued, multivariate function. So there in the change of variables formula, what we have is in fact the gradient of this function with respect to z, and then we take the determinant. So what does that thing look like? So if this is how I define my function, then uh, the gradient z of tz is basically a matrix. And here we'd have del t1 by del z1, del t2 by del z2, uh, del, z, oh, sorry. Del z t. And then the second row would be del t2 by del z1, del t2 by del z2, and the partial derivative of t2 with respect to zt, and so on till this. So this is what the gradient there is. And then you take the determinant of this matrix. So this is what the change of variables formula looks like, right? Uh, so uh, then, yeah? Uh, you probably said this, but is t invertible? Like you want to do a by check? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask that question in the next slide, but yeah, it has to be here. So for this to be defined, t has to be invertible, and it has to be a bijection. But I'll explain that question in the next slide more. Right? So the recipe for learning here is uh, the following. So. We are given a data set D, where we have the points x1, x2, x3, so on till xn, which come from this density qx. We want to approximate this density. So what we do is we choose a simple source density pz, uh, that is up to us, and we use the maximum likelihood principle. So we know this, this is the likelihood of my data points under qxi, but I can write it in this form now. This is just the change of variables I have applied to each data point. And so now I need to learn a t hat, which maximizes this, right? And this is the same as maximizing the logarithm of it. So it is the same as t hat is r max of the logarithm of, of this. So that's the, that's the training procedure here. But the question here is, uh, 
There are certain problems with this. Can you identify what the problem here is still? So the first thing is that, uh, what are these zis? I mean, we are given just these x1, x2, so on till xn. We are not given these zis in the latent space from this pz. So what are these zis? How, how do I calculate these zis? So that, that was what the question was. Uh, we need the inverse to. So zis are just the inverse, right? Because x is t, uh, x is t of z, so z is t inverse of x. So I need the inverse of the function as well. The next thing is we need this determinant here, right? But computing a determinant in practice is a very expensive operation. It, it would take a d cube, or it's order d cube. Right? And for higher dimensions, that's, that's very costly. So how do I circumvent it, right? So this is uh, computationally doing this is very expensive. So what's in, uh, what uh, matrices, for what matrices the calculation of determinant is easy or fast? Yeah, or triangular, right? So a triangular matrix or a diagonal matrix, the calculation of determinant is easy because it's just the product of the diagonal entries. So in that case, it's order D time. So now I'll show you that how uh, the computation of both the inverse function and the Jacobian is cheap uh, with these functions that we call triangular maps. Okay. Oh, sorry. So now I'll introduce what these triangular maps are. So, uh, okay, uh, one thing I should tell that uh, for the sake of completeness, I put all these references here as footnotes. You're not obliged to read all of these uh, references. Some of these are actually pretty mathematically involved, but it's just for sake of completeness, right? So uh, the slides are, uh, well, are, should be good enough. Otherwise, the blog by Eric Jiang should be enough too. So what are increasing triangular maps? So let's say we have a function t from Rd to Rd again. So a triangular map is of this form. So basically, here you see what I'd done was I had written x1 to be a function of all of these z1, z2, so on till zd. But in a triangular map, x1 is just a function of z1 and not the other variables. And then x2 becomes, is a function of z1, z, and z2 only. And then x3 is just a function of z1, z2, and z3. So in a triangular map, xdj is just a function of z1, z2, so until zj. So xj would just depend on z1, z2, so until zj. And xd would be of this form. And why is it called triangular? Because now if you write this gradient, you would see all these zeros. Because you see, now uh, in a triangular map, uh, t1 is no longer dependent on z2. So this derivative becomes 0. And all these derivatives become zero. So in this, in this row, uh, this would become zero, and all of these still here become zero. Then in the second row, this would be non-negative, and uh, or this would be non-zero, and this would be non-zero because t two is both a function of z one and z two, but everything else from here is zero, and so on. So if I write the the this this matrix now all the non-zero entries would be in this sort of a triangular format, which is why it is called a uh, triangular transformation. So now you see, uh, now if I have to take the determinant of this matrix, it will just be the product of the diagonal entries, these D entries. So right now you don't have to worry about why we need increasing. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it ensures that uh, if there, there, it, there is a theorem that uh, I'm paraphrasing here that there always exists an increasing triangular map that can transform any source density into any target density. So you, take any, you choose any density, for example, a Gaussian, and you want to approximate any other density, there will always be a triangular map that can do it, an increasing triangular map. Uh, but uh, so this is of interest to us. And most of the normalizing flow research is basically focused on how to build uh, now these transformations T1, T2, T3 which are triangular, and so that you can do this density estimation. So any questions till now? All right.
So the good thing is that the math here is almost done, so I won't be doing any more definitions of uh, functions at all. I'll just now introduce some of the normalizing flows and how they use this kind of uh, increasing architecture. So the framework now is that you pick a density, which is simple, so z, which is from this density pz. So again, I cannot stress enough that this, you can choose anything you want. It is up to you. It can be a normal distribution, it can be a uniform distribution, whatever you think is easier for you. You can choose this distribution here. And then we want to approximate this, uh, this density qx. And so you start off with z1 and uh, run it through some transformation t1 to get x1. Then t2 takes as input both z1 and z2 and gives you x2 and you do this iteratively so that TD takes as input Z1, Z2, so until ZD and gives you XT. So this is how you build this triangular structure. The, the question of course is uh, what should I choose as transformations now, which is what uh, I will describe in the next few slides. And so now the learning procedure by maximizing the likelihood, uh, here I have the minimum because I'm taking the negative log likelihood is just log of p of z. So notice this t inverse of xi is just zi. And this is now the log determinant because the determinant is now just the product of the diagonals. And if it's the product of the diagonals and I take the logarithm, it becomes the sum of the diagonals. And so it is just the sum of the log of these diagonal entries on this uh, matrix that I've shown here. So this becomes the objective that we uh, optimize on for normalizing flows. All right, so now I'll uh, give examples of a few methods uh, or few flow-based methods and what kind of transformations they use. So I mean, basically now what we have is we have a full uh, unifying framework. This triangular map gives you a unifying framework. All that we need to now specify is, um, is this transformation T1, T2, so until TD. What do these transformation looks like? Right? Because I've not said anything about those yet, uh, but they come from certain families and what those families are is all that is required now. So the first one is the simplest one, uh, which, we will, which is a linear transformation. But before I get into that, I'll introduce these autoregressive models because they sort of give some intuition on why we build these kind of transformations. So let's say I have uh, a random variable x, again, which is an RD. And I want to write the joint density over this. So this x is basically, again, x1, x2, so until xt. Uh, and I want to write the joint density here. So I know that I can write the joint density q of x as q of x1 times q of x2 given x1. Or you can write here q1, q2 times so on to q xt given x less than t, right? Does everyone know this? That a joint density can be written just as a product of the marginals and the conditional distributions, right? And so now, when I was building those transformations, what I had done was I said x1 is a function t1 of z1, and x2 was a function t2 of z1 and z2, right? But you can also think of this as x2 as a function of t2, which depends on x1 and z2. Because x1 is a function of z1, so basically you can think of z1 being substituted by x1. And so what this means is that here the distribution that you're capturing is almost the same as q2 of x2 given x1. And here the distribution that you're capturing is q1 of x1. And in the next iteration, the distribution that you'd capture, t3, z1, z2, z3, is this q3, x2, or x3 given x1, x2, and so on. So basically, the intuition is that these triangular maps are capturing this kind of distribution. Right? So this is uh, at a higher level. And so these are, this kind of uh, intuition is called autoregressive model. So in autoregressive model, what you do is you 
write a joint density in terms of the product of their marginals and conditional distributions. And then you parameterize each of these distributions. So for example, you say that each of these distribution comes from a Gaussian, and you just approximate what these Gaussians are. And then you take the product, so, and, and then you approximate the density. So uh, what I'll do is in, instead of explaining this slide, I'll explain the next slide in which I've taken the precisely this example. So now what I have is this Qx, the joint density, is basically a product of these normal distributions. Right? So Q1, X1 is a normal distribution with mean mu1 and variance sigma1 squared. Q2 of X2 given X1 is again a normal distribution of mu2, uh, normal distribution with mean mu2 and variance sigma2 squared, and so on. So now here, uh, the, because it is conditioned on x1, what this means is that these mean and variances are basically functions of x1. So these depend on x1, which is where the conditionality comes from. So now if I were to learn a transformation from, let's say, a standard Gaussian, so a standard Gaussian is mean 0 and variance 1, onto this normal distribution, what will be my transformation? So how do I transform? So my question is that I have uh, let's say z that is normal 0, 1. And I want to transform it onto x that is normal mu sigma square. So how, what function do I write here? So how do I write x is equal to something plus something of z? What are these somethings? Uh, right. Uh, in fact, it, it would be mu plus sigma z, right? So this function will transform this random variable into this. The mean is mu if you take the expectation, and the variance is sigma square. So that is what here we will do. So to transform this standard normal over z1 into this normal distribution over mu1 and sigma1 square, this is the transformation. So my t1 becomes this linear transformation. Right, of sigma 1 times z1 plus mu 1. Then in the next iteration, I have that z2 gets transformed onto x2. But now these mu 2 and sigma 2 are functions of x1. So that's what I will do. x2 is sigma 2 of z1 times z2 plus mu 2 of z1. And this is a function t2 of z2, z1. Right? So this is a linear function again in z2. And then we do this iteratively so that xd is sigma d dependent on z less than d times z d plus mu d uh, dependent on z less than d, which becomes the function t d. And together, this whole thing is, a, is triangular because you see t1, x1 is a function of z1, x2 is a function of z1, z2, and xd is a function of z1, z2, z3, so on till z d. And the form here is, is a linear transformation. And so now you can train this network. And the parameters that you have to train for are these sigma 1, mu 1, sigma 2, mu 2, and so on. So these are the parameters that you train for. So when in the earlier uh, case where I had written this log likelihood or maximizing the log likelihood, I had said that it is a minimization over t. Then here it becomes a minimization over these parameters, which define the transformation. Any questions still here? You should stop me if I'm going faster. This is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that this is a, this is a little involved uh, framework, and it's not easy to uh, get into this straight away. So please ask me questions if you have any. All right, so, so this kind of framework was proposed in this paper in 2016 uh, by King et al, uh, called Improved Variational Inference with Inverse Autoregressive Flows. So this, I'm just, uh, I'll call this whole transformation, this linear transformation as AR from now on. And I'll now show you how you can make this more complicated transformation by stacking multiple of these transformations. So these are called mask autoregressive flows. So here what you do is you start off with a random variable Z and you apply that AR transformation that I had shown that linear transformation. And you get another random variable Z1. Right? And now the density of this z1 is basically by change of variables exactly this. p of z times the determinant of t1, uh, or the gradient of t1, you take the determinant and times the inverse. Right? And now what you can do is you can do this sequentially. So you take another transformation, you apply it on z1 to get z2. 
And so by the change of variables formula, all you have to do is multiply here with this determinant of this transformation now, right? And so now Z2 has this density. And you can keep doing this as many times as you want to increase the complexity of your transformation to get a final transformation over X, which can be written in this manner. And still here, it is easy to compute because these are all triangular transformations. So you can take the, uh, the Jacobian or the, the determinant easily you can evaluate and take the inverse as well. The question is, what are these P's here? So you see here, uh, when I had written this form here, uh, I've basically fixed an ordering. So here what I'm saying is that X2 is conditioned on X1. Or in this function, I'm saying that uh, X2 is only dependent on Z1 and Z2. But the question would be, well, what if they are dependent on Z3 or Z4? How do we know that this is the case? So here I'm safe because I know that uh, the ordering does not matter and there are certain results for this. But what this P matrix here are doing is it's a permutation matrix. So what permutation matrix is doing is that once you have this X1, X2, X3 in here at this point, you permute this order so that you can change the ordering in the next step. So you permute it so that it becomes, let's say X3 becomes, X1 becomes X3 uh, and X2 becomes something else. So what I'm doing here essentially is the following. Uh, so let's say my, I have X1, X2, X3, and I apply a permutation matrix to this. Uh, so that I can get a reverse, some, some other ordering. So the ordering that I'm interested in is this, right? So my permutation matrix here will look like the following. I want X3 here, so I will put 0, 0, 1. Uh, X1 here, so it would be 1, 0, 0, and this would be 0, 1, 0, right? So this is what my P matrix here is. So basically what I've done is that I have gotten some random variable Z1, it has some ordering, and I've permuted that ordering so that I'm breaking the correlations and then having some different kind of correlation. So it's like coupling. And I keep on doing this so, so that I get more complicated transformation. So this is what this permutation matrix is. The permutation matrix doesn't add anything into this formula because the determinant is, is one for it. It's just a rotation matrix. So that's all there is here. And so this was proposed in 2017 as mask autoregressive flows for density estimation. The transformations are still triangular, right? So another um, ones are called real NVP. In, yeah. Oh, so why do we put stack these many transformations? So it increases the complexity because you see here this is triangular, but after I've made a permutation, the resultant transformation is no longer triangular. So what I'm basically, what you can think of is that I'm sort of learning a more complex transformation here. So you can think of increasing the depth here by stacking multiple transformation. So think of it as function composition. You have x square, right? And now you do another x square on it, you get x to the power four. Right? So you do x of, you do a, a, a function composition there. And then you can do this iteratively. So you're basically increasing the power there of your polynomial. Right? So th in, in that manner, you can think of what these uh, stacking of transformations is doing is allowing you uh, the ability to learn more complex transformations. So that you can, because ultimately what you want is you want to capture any density. Right? So x in real life, uh, these densities can be anything. We do not know beforehand that they, follow some nice form. So you want a flexible enough method that can transform any fixed density onto anything else, right? And here, you're choosing a lot of leeway here because you are allowing freedom to use a very simple density here, which is just normal. You want to transform it to something that is more very complicated. And so that complexity has to be in the transformation. So we took advantage of the fact that the triangle matrix already, and now we can compose. Exactly, yeah. And you see, because it's triangular, uh, all these computations are still easy. It's just order D for each of these. Uh, if we apply just the uh, linear transformation on the uh, uh, source uh, distribution, uh, so can we find just uh, one universal linear transformation, which is the combination of all of these linear transformations to do all of these things? So we can, but uh, you see, once I have applied this permutation, uh, the transformation is no longer triangular which means that taking the Jacobian is, is expensive. It's now d cube, 
right? So we can learn a full transformation, but then we would have to be, it would be computationally expensive. So this okay. circumvents that in some manner. You had a result earlier that there's always a triangular mapping from one distribution to another, but that was not a linear one, right? It's not a linear one. So you have linear in your iteration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is hoping that it approximates. Uh, later on, I'll show you two transformations that are actually universal in the sense that they can approximate anything. Yeah. Any more questions? All right. So the transformation that I've shown right now is a linear transformation or stacking this linear transformation. Uh, real NVP was another method. Uh, actually, this was proposed earlier than the previous ones. And um, here, uh, it's, it's still a linear transformation. So this T is still a linear transformation. But what they're doing is they're, they, they split this Z into two parts, Z1 and Z2. And Z1 has some uh, random <coughs> variables that go unchanged into X1. So these are exactly the same. These do not change. And in here, on these random variables, uh, you apply this transformation T. So, so basically what they're doing is that here, for some of the variables, this, this transformation is identity. So X1, which I say is T1 of Z1, is basically just equal to Z1. And X2, which is this, is just basically equal to Z2. And on the others, they apply this linear transformation. And then they build more complicated transformations by stacking multiple layers of this using permutation. So this was real NVP. In fact, they were the first ones to propose this kind of permutation and coupling, and then the others picked it up. Uh, so this is what the transformation looks like. It's still linear. I've just, I mean, this is a more intimidating form of how those linear transformations are. But if you look, it's just linear in ZJ. With this, you can think of as sigma, and this as mu. Uh, last year, uh, at this conference, ICML, uh, was uh, this paper called Neural Autoregressive Flows. And in there, what they did was they replaced this transformation T with a deep neural network. So deep neural networks are basically function approximators. And so they use these deep neural networks there. So what they're doing is you take in Z1, pass it through a deep neural network to give X1. And, and the weights come from some other neural network, which is denoted here by C. And then in the next case, Z2 goes through this neural network to give X2. The weights are again coming from this neural, neural network. But now this neural network takes as input Z1, which is what I meant here, that X2 is a function of Z1 and Z2. Because now you see these weights of this neural network are a function of Z1. And so this X2 becomes a function of both Z1 and Z2. And so you do this iteratively so that xd becomes a function of z1, z2, so on till zd. So xd is coming from this neural network, which has weights coming from another neural network, which takes as input z1, z2, so on till zd minus 1. And you put in zd, and you get xd. So in functional form, you can write that xj is just a deep neural network of zj, given these weights. But uh, you notice that uh, I had said earlier that we need the transformations to be invertible, right? So in general, how do so what they do is they impose certain um, restrictions on the weights. So the weights that they use here are strictly positive, and the activation functions here are strictly monotonic activation functions to ensure that the map is both increasing and you can take the inverse properly. So the, these are some constraints they had to put. And to answer his question, uh, they were the first to show that this kind of a transformation is universal. So I'd shown earlier a theorem that said that you can transform any source density into any target density using a triangular map. And so here, what this shows is that if you use these kind of functions, it can actually approximate that triangular, triangular map arbitrarily well. Because that's what you can do in practice, right? You want to approximate it. So this was last year. Uh, this year, I, along with my supervisor, Yao Liang, uh, we wrote a paper called Sum of Squares Polynomial Flows. So here, what we did was we now, uh, so the functions that I've introduced you to are linear transformations and neural networks. What we proposed was using polynomials there. And uh, in fact, sum of squares of polynomials. So what it means is that we have the same kind of structure. We have Z1. And we consider some polynomials of Z1 with coefficients A1 and A2. And these coefficients come from a neural network C, like the neural autoregressive flow. And then what we do is we sum these polynomials to get, and we say that that is my derivative. And it would be always positive, because it's a square of polynomials. And then I integrate, or we integrate this, this, this thing to get x1. 
So basically, it is sum of squares is here, and we sum it, and then we integrate it. And in practice, integration of a polynomial is not difficult. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a, uh, just one simple tensor operation. So you can do integration. And so this is the family that we choose of higher degree polynomials. right? And then you do this iteratively. To sh so on Zd, now you consider the polynomials. You sum it up, take the integral to get xt. And the coefficients come from another neural network with parameters z1, z2, so until zd minus 1. And we showed that this is also universal. So like using a neural network, it's universal. This is also universal. So we also showed certain properties of this. So we call this SOS flows. In fact, um, in, in, in computer science or in optimization, to sum of squares have been explored a lot for a lot of properties. For example, relaxation of a non-convex optimization problem into a convex optimization problem, and so on. So you use these kinds of uh, sum of squares of polynomials. And there is a rich literature on its uses in different fields there. So this is, and we, we applied it here in flow-based methods. So what we showed was that this is a generalization of these other methods. So all three methods I introduced you with, and all three use linear transformations, right? And now we are using these higher order polynomials. So this is obviously a generalization of these methods. They are interpretable in the sense that uh, you see in a linear transformation, the mu and sigma were the mean and the variance. And for higher degree polynomials, you can show that these exactly uh, control the higher order moments of your target distribution. So higher order moments would be like kurtosis and skewness and so on. And they are easier to train in the sense that we have no constraints on the coefficient. So I told you that in neural autoregressive flows, where they were using these deep neural networks, there were, there were constraints, right? That the weights have to be strictly positive, the activation has to be strictly, non, uh, strictly monotonic, and so on. So there were these constraints. But here, there are no constraints, so they, they become easier to train. And they are universal in the sense that they can capture any target density. Right? And uh, there are other applications to stochastic simulation, et cetera. So uh, in fact, what, uh, what I've told you in this lecture is, in, uh, is, is what is the research that is currently happening here. And this is, in fact, a unifying framework of that research, that to build normalizing flows, you need to learn these transformations that are bijective and differentiable, and you can take the inverse of. Right? And the way to do that is that you build triangular transformations. And what I've shown here is that these popular methods are, in fact, just uh, in some manner these triangular transformations that you can use to build these flows. And in, uh, I have shown here only a subset of these methods, but you, uh, mostly any paper you take, for example, uh, I'll introduce another paper here, GLOW, that also uses a transformation that can be cast as a triangular transformation. Of course, there are other methods that are non-triangular too, but as I showed with this theorem, that triangular transformations, in fact, suffice here. Right. Uh, so now I'll go to this promised uh, architecture where I said that I'll tell you what this, what is the architecture to produce that images that would interpolate a face to some face which is of an old person. So this was uh, this came out uh, in December of 2018, where they're using invertible one. Uh, the method is called Glow and it introduces this invertible one cross one convolutions. So what they're doing is, uh, again, you have this input noise z. And you pass uh, the architecture looks like this. So the first layer is the act norm layer. So it is some sort of a normalization or batch normalization. But they, uh, they, they have some data dependence here. So they define it themselves, this act norm. So they do this act norm on z. Then they apply this invertible one cross one convolution. And what this basically is doing is uh, actually capturing this permutation matrix. So you see, you see permutation is basically a rotation matrix. And you can think of a one cross one convolution as a generalization of a permutation matrix. So basically what they're doing is they're um, parametrizing this permutation with this one cross one convolution. And they learn the weights of this thing. So, so this you can think of as, as a random rotation matrix. Because a permutation is just a rotation matrix. right? But if you specify it in this manner, then you are fixing the permutation, which is what other methods were doing. But here, what they're doing is they initialize it with a random rotation vector, and they learn the weights of this one cross one convolution. So basically, they're learning this. And then they apply this affine coupling layer. So the affine coupling layer is exactly the linear transformation that I talked about. 
So that is exactly this linear transformation. And so you go through this and you get this x. And if you want, then you can become fancier and you can uh, put multiple of these layers, right? So one on top of the other, as I had said, in these masks or these uh, stacking of these layers to make it more uh, complex. So what the description of each of these is that uh, the act norm there, uh, the function transformation. So there, um, I've just taken the screen gap to grab directly from the paper. So from the notations that I've been using in the lecture, their y is x and x is the z's that I'm seeing. So you can think of this x as the input and y as the output. So what the act norm layer, layer is doing is, again, some sort of normalization here. So this element-wise s times xij plus b. And because you need the inverse as well, so the inverse function is written here. And the log determinant is just this, this form in this matrix. And the random rotation is just w times xij. So you can think of it as uh, this, this permutation matrix now becomes a random rotation, which is what w is, and times this x matrix. So this is what you have here. And the inverse is then trivial, because you just take the inverse of this matrix. Right? And then you take the, the log determinant is just the log determinant of this w matrix. And to make it easier, what they have done is that this W matrix, they use this LU decomposition, so lower upper triangular decomposition. So they write W as LU times something so that the evaluation of the Jacobian is cheap. So that's what is shown here. And then the affine coupling layer here, they have written multiple expressions, but uh, it's basically the linear transformation that I showed. It's just that. So this is the whole architecture here. Uh, and so they created in the paper, they reported these images, uh, which were pretty sharp. And why this uh, was, at least for me, a revelation was uh, there was this wisdom that uh, any method that is trained using log likelihood cannot create images that are sharp, that you would get blurry images. And that was, that was what we had seen. And I used to believe that too. And this was a paper that actually trained it using log likelihood and showed that the images were in fact sharp. And these were actually pretty, pretty nice images. Here it's not the projector is not doing them justice, but these are very sharp images. They did a second set of experiments. So I told about you input an image, and it generates an image of a person of how it would look when they're old. So here, they didn't do exactly old, but like you'd input an image, and it outputs an image of a smiling person, or pale skin, or narrow eyes, and so on. And how they did that is in the following manner. So for example, you have some data set. And in that, uh, you have, uh, uh, so you, you find, you label your data set. So you have, let's say, x1, x2, so on till xn. And you want to know whether uh, uh, you want to do interpolation to an old person. So how you do that is, here in the data set, you label whether this image was old of an old person or not. So basically, a binary vector 0, 1, right? So you have some 0, 1, 0, so on till like this. So 1 denotes that this is of an old person, and 0 denotes that the image was not of an old person. And let's say then you get that I write x old is my data, which consists of these uh, points uh, x to so on till some xd prime of all the persons that were labeled as old. And I also have x not old. So I'll write uh, not old here, right? Is the data set of all the people that have been labeled not old, right? So what you do is you have trained that transformation. So you have a transformation uh, z to x. So what you do is you do a inverse of this. So you find how these uh, images that were old have a corresponding vector in the latent space. So you, let's say you have some z2 here, so until zd prime. And then you take the mean of this. And this you say is z positive. So z positive is the average of the latent vectors that encode the old images in your data set. And this is the average. And similarly for this, you take z negative, which is just the average of the latent and, uh, representations of these images that were not old. So now what happens is, if this is your latent space z, and let's say you have z 
positive here and z negative here, then this is the direction basically. This is some direction, right? So now you're given, let's say, some other image. So I input the image x tilde. And I want to convert it into an old person's image. So what they do is that they use this transformation that they have learned, t inverse, to find z tilde first. So let's say z tilde is here. And so this direction is where they move using this z tilde. Because this direction says, if you go in this direction, that means that you're going to the younger, because that's what it encodes, right? Z negative is that it's younger, and Z positive it's older. So you move in the direction of the old person. And that's what they're showing in the results there. You see, these are interpolations, basically. So this was the image that they input, and they interpolated by moving in that direction in the latent space and finding out what the X results in, resulting in this image. Could you just describe Sorry? Yeah, so uh, here by latent space, what I mean is this, uh, this distribution z. Because this, is you, this is what you choose, right? So it is sort of like uh, a hidden distribution or so on. So what this means is that uh, you are, uh, it captures certain properties of this x. So that's why I call, call this as a latent space. So this here, this z uh, random variable, the distribution of that is what I'm calling as the latent space. Does that answer your question? Sorry, um, what guarantees in this work that uh, uh, you are not mapping uh, someone's young picture to some other person's old picture? I mean, uh, the one by one mapping. Right, right, right. So yeah, I mean, those are uh, more, um, like those are have to be closer to the image here. I mean, you, you would say that in the neighborhood it would still be uh, encode similar properties. So for example, they also have an encoding. Uh, let me see if I have the paper open in my slides. So I'll show you something more. Uh, right. So this is the paper. So here uh, in this uh, picture, uh, figure five, what they have done is exactly your question of, you, they have taken this person and they have another person image here. Right, so these are two, let's say this is Z1 and this is Z2, and they basically do a linear interpolation from Z1 and Z to Z2 to see what the images look like, right? And so you see, in the beginning it's the same person and then it gradually changes. But throughout the path, the, I mean, you would agree that all of them look like a person, right? The images are exactly, I mean, they look like some sort of person. So, but closer they look like the same person, right? And so you just choose the direction here in that manner so that it stays the same person, but it becomes older. It's like uh, in natural language processing too, you have this encodings, right? That you say you have something for a queen and then you want a king. So you basically say the queen would be some male plus royalty. And then you, for the king, oh, so for the queen, it would be female plus royalty. And for male, you would say ma female plus royalty minus female plus male would give you king, which is what is happening here as well. Right, so there, these are these operations that would do that in the latent space. <coughs> so this is uh, the, the glow paper, right? So um, if, if I were to, so th this is mostly what I wanted to talk to you about in normalizing flows, but if I were to say the take home message from here it's, it's the following. Why we use these deep generative models normalizing flows is because we need this explicit representation of densities, which other generative models like GANs and VAs do not do. Of course, I mean, these images, et cetera, GANs, as we know, produce really sharp images. But here, we, I just showed you some normalizing flow that was doing the same. How we do this, the basic uh, building block is the change of variables formula. The change of variables formula allows us to transform one density to the, to the other. The problem uh, there, we have to consider bijective transformations so that we can take the inverse. And we consider triangular transformations because we wanted an efficient representation or to capture the Jacobian or the determinant efficiently. But we saw that triangular transformations suffice in transforming one distribution to the other. And so I introduced you with some flow-based methods uh, that encode these transformations. And in fact, I mean, this is 
actually a decent overview of the kind of research that is presently happening in these flow-based methods. So as you can see, the, most of the papers that I talked about are from the past one or two years only, right? But before I end, I'll ask you a question. So what do you think is the problem with flows here? I mean, here I've shown you that they generate images. They generate, in fact, images that are pretty sharp. But you can also get this density from this change of variables formula. So it feels like it's giving us everything that we want, but there should be a catch somewhere, right? What's the catch? Like, what would you think is still some drawbacks of these flow-based methods? So one of the drawbacks is uh, the computation in the sense that you see, I'm learning a transformation that is from RD to RD. So it is, if D becomes very high dimensional, Right? So this is a very difficult problem to still do, capturing these transformations, because it requires a lot of data. So if D is, for example, million, right, I would require a lot of parameters to initialize this kind of a learning procedure. And so I would require a lot of data to learn that. And that is often uh, very difficult to do in practice. And in, in GANs and VAEs, what they do is they have this bottleneck. So in their case, the Z. Uh, is not RD, but of very low dimension. And so they, 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 that is why they use that, this bottleneck. Uh, but here, in normalizing flows, if you need the exact representation, you, want, you need both of these to be of the same dimension. I mean, at least till now, I don't know if there are some generalizations to that. But that, that is where a problem happens with normalizing flows. Yeah. For this image, so uh, I, I don't know for Celeb A what it is. Uh, so for M NIST, I don't know if you, it was, I think, so 8 cross 8 is the thing. And then CFAR 10 has a much higher dimension and so on. So the, these are also pretty high dimensions in, in that manner. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly. Uh, maybe I can check in the paper. Yeah, I don't see the dimensions here. But yeah, I mean, uh, these are all uh, normal data sets that are used in experiments in this case, and they're pretty high dimensional. So it's not the dimension of the latent space, it's the dimension of the images? Yeah, but you see here, uh, in normalizing flows, this, so this is the image, and this is the dimension of the images. But because I want to learn the represent, uh, I want to explicitly represent the density, and so the transformation that I'm learning through change of variables formula, the latent space is also has to be of the same dimension. And so this t function is also has this t1, t2, so on till td. And all of these individual functions will have associated parameters, and which you have to learn. Right? And that is where it becomes problematic. Any more questions? Right, right. So I mean, those are uh, th those are in how you construct the transformations. So, for example, in the sum of squares of polynomials, these sums that we were creating were precisely so that we can capture these multiple modes, right? And in 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 this neural autoregressive flows where they have these um, neural networks as transformations, that is the first experiment that they do to show that they can capture these multiple modes in there. And in the earlier ones where I had shown these uh, linear transformations, and then you stack multiple of these transformations, there are also some of the synthetic experiments were geared towards how that these capture these multiple modes. So there are, there are these things. So it, 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 it depends on the, also the data, right? So how multimodal the data is. But, but uh, experiments have suggested that these are able to capture such multimodal distributions. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So let me go to that slide. Yeah. So here, uh, 
So these are the outputs of the, the weights are output of this neural network, right? So I mean, training on this uh, on the weights is basically training on the parameters of this network, then, right? So basically, the the, the training then becomes uh, implicitly of these parameters. Yeah, because I mean, the likelihood would have these weights, right? Okay. The likelihood would have these weights, and these weights are just a function of this neural network. So basically, you can write it as the function, the neural network parameters, and then you train on that. Any other question? All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'll, uh, actually, I'll re on Piazza, I'll release a code snippet. It's just 100 lines of code on how to implement this linear affine transformations that I'd shown. So that's also something that I've taken from a tutorial from Eric Jack. And uh, if you're interested, it's a, it's a very simple procedure on how to train these networks. Thanks.